F-A-B, standing by. F-A-B. 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 It's happened. Terrorism hits Melbourne as six bombs explode, injuring 21 people. Good evening and welcome to Network 10 viewers around Australia. The lunchtime attack on the eve of Easter came in a series of explosions around the Russell Street Police Headquarters and just across the road from the City Magistrates Court and City Watch House buildings. A policewoman is among the seriously injured. She has burns to 80% of her body and Magistrate Ian West was among those injured. The explosions left the top end of the city in chaos as it took some time for the impact of the attack to be realised. And tonight, Victoria's Police Deputy Commissioner of Operations, Keith Thompson, said today's attack placed Melbourne at the forefront of world terrorism. The area around police headquarters remains cordoned off. Brian Shrouder starts our coverage of the horror city bombings. <laughs> Russell Street was thrown into a scene of mass panic by the blast. The first explosion went off just before one o'clock when a car blew up outside the police headquarters. <laughs> Eyewitness news cameras were first on the scene. Well, just uh, a few minutes ago, a car bomb exploded outside the police station here in Russell Street. There was a the sound of one massive explosion. We were sitting in our office, our Eyewitness News office, just around the corner. The glass was shattered in the windows of our office. After that, there were several more explosions, the sound of probably fuel in the car exploding. Russell Street was in a complete state of chaos for seconds. Russell Street was in a state of chaos. Policemen, policewomen were screaming. Everybody was in a state of complete hysteria. Nineteen people in the busy lunchtime crowd were injured. Two police officers and a passerby are in a serious condition. Three cars were destroyed in the six explosions. There was massive damage to nearby buildings. Russell Street was covered in a thick cloud of black smoke. After receiving a phone call saying there was a second bomb, police moved crowds back. The entire northern part of the city was evacuated, south to Burke Street and north to Queensbury Street. The city was brought to a standstill. The police dog squad and army disposal experts made an intensive search of all the vehicles parked in the area. All that was left of the first bombed car was a twisted, burning wreck. Fire brigade officers say there may have been two bombs planted. Police found gel ignite in a detonator lying in Russell Street near the blast. So far, police have no idea of a motive for the bombing. Brian Schrader, Eyewitness News. On the eve of the Easter break, thousands more people than usual were in the city and caught in the panic. People walked around days knowing nothing and bewildered by the screams around them. Reporter Elise O'Neill was one of the thousands caught up in the terror. I was standing out in Mackenzie Street, just around the corner from Russell, when the first explosion hit. Like an earth tremor, the buildings shook and the windows all around us shattered. As we rushed onto the street, debris started flying all over the place, almost hitting most of us. The first thing we saw were people pouring out of the buildings. There was one woman dragged off with bleeding legs. The crowd seemed to gather from nowhere, but they were being pushed further and further back. The special operations group people moved in. Every car was a potential bomb and they had to check them all. Everybody was being pushed further and further away out into the city streets. Russell Exhibition and Swanston Streets were all evacuated. Russell Street Police Headquarters was cleared, as was the City Watch House. With today being the eve of the Easter break, many more people than usual were in town and trapped in the horror. Nobody knew exactly what had happened, only that it was something terrible. I was on the first floor at Russell Street. What did you hear or see? 
Just a very loud bang, glass breaking, and um, a lot of people screaming. How did you get injured yourself? Oh, just from falling glass. Well, all I heard was this big explosion. So I just automatically ran outside to see what was happening. And what about you? Well, I was facing the window and I heard the huge explosion and the window just shook. The glass panel just moved. It was just like a gas explosion. And how frightened were you? Very frightened. It was a very powerful explosion. A lot of wreckage and debris over the road. Um, there was a car on fire. Uh, injured persons, um, an injured police were being helped to the steps of the front uh, of the Russell Street Police Complex. As if the building was... Uh, one taking off one and then crashed back down to the ground again. Yeah. The city remained in a state of virtual terror all afternoon as police reported telephone threats of more bombs in the area. Everything was treated as a potential explosive and evacuations extended into the Carlton area. This evening, the city remains in chaos. Streets are still closed, peak hour traffic in some areas has been brought almost to a standstill and it's expected to be several hours before things are back to normal. Elisa O'Neill, Eyewitness News. Victims of the explosions were immediately rushed by ambulance to Melbourne's major hospitals. A family of three was injured by the blast, which also put an end to their hopes of moving into a new house for Easter. Jennifer Hansen reports. The number of injured as a result of the bomb blasts is now estimated to be 21. A policewoman received burns to 80% of her body and is one of the most critically injured victims. Stipendiary magistrate Ian West was also injured, but it's not yet known how severely. Three policemen were admitted to St Vincent's Hospital treated for cuts, including one officer who may need an operation to remove glass from his eye. During the chaos, one policewoman even threw herself over a colleague to protect him from further injury. While here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, seven patients have been admitted as a result of the bomb explosions. Five suffered minor injuries with cuts and abrasions, and two are in a serious condition, one with burns, the other with fractures. John Bannon, his wife and two-year-old son um, Jay were in Russell Street when the bombs exploded. Well, there was three cars parked across the road and then there was this almighty explosion and one of the cars uh, just burst into flame and showered us with sort of debris and everything else and with that it sort of threw us against the wall and down on the ground. I think one of the guards of the car came down on top of Jenny's head so it hit the wall and bounced off and gashed all the shoulder and that. And Jay was wandering around, he hit the ground, so we threw him to the ground. Um, I don't know, it was just like a big fireball. It's a double tragedy for the Bannon family, who today expected to move into a new flat ready for Easter. However, they were on their way to pick up keys to the new apartment when the string of explosions began. Now the estate agency is closed, as are transport companies. Just a matter of where to live now, for the weekend, because of what's happened. As I said, we're shifting at 12 o'clock today, but when this happened, well, bombed out those uh, plans, you know. The start to a new life for the Bannon family has been shattered, and even young Jay knows why. As Melbourne reels in shock, Deputy Commissioner of Operations for the Victoria Police, Keith Thompson, says Melbourne has been thrust to the forefront of world terrorism. Mr Thompson says a large squad of police has been assigned to the case, and National Intelligence Services have been called in to examine the whole range of people who may be suspect. It's now some four hours later after the bomb blasts and police are now trying to assess exactly what happened. Just a few moments ago, Mr Thompson held a press conference. Well, what are your theories now? Well, we don't have any real theories at this point. We, uh, we've got a lot of facts. We don't have a lot of theories. What are the facts? The well, facts are the car exploded outside Russell Street and it's done an enormous amount of damage. And there'll be no other devices found. Well, we don't know that. All we've got left with at the moment is a heap of debris and we've got experts looking at that now. When that's done, uh, we'll know more about that. Have you established how many car bombs there were? Well, that's difficult to say at this particular point in time, but I believe what has happened is that there's been a primary explosion and it hasn't exploded all the devices and they've gone off successively after the primary explosion. But that's only a theory at this time when the experts have looked, we'll know more about it. Any connection with the court case on it, the magistrate's court? No, there's been no conclusions arrived at anything yet. The detectives are working on it now with the intelligence people and we're very early time yet. Will any precautions be taken at the police station around Victoria now? Well, yes, I think that'll have to happen, um, at least in the short term, but we'll be looking at security in, in other areas. 
Has anyone phoned to claim responsibility for the... No, we've had no one yet claim responsibility for Were it. Were there any threats beforehand? Anything that may have given you a warning that was going to happen? No, there were no warnings and no threats. Kevin Hitchcock is at the scene of the attack live now. Kevin, what's the very latest? Yes, David. Well, the scene here now could only be described as eerie. Stunned uniformed police are still searching for pieces of wreckage. Members of the various scientific and forensic squads are still scouring for clues. A short while ago, we were able to get a film crew in to have a look at the actual site of the blast, where the car carrying the explosives went up. It uh, caused a great deal of damage to the street and threw wreckage for hundreds of metres. It also caused a lot of damage to the the pavement and the building, uh, in, uh, of course, outside, which was the police complex. Police are still inside the building. They've been finding bits of wreckage inside. All the windows in the street were blown out. The police complex was quite badly damaged, and I'm told that at the moment they're checking because they fear that it might have been structurally damaged and could be unsafe. The intensity of the blast was also such that it damaged pipes underground. Water and gas mains are leaking into the underground railway system, and, in fact, trains between museum and parliament have been stopped. So it was an enormous blast which has shocked everybody here and in fact uh, the police here, many of them seasoned people, they've seen a lot of crime scenes, a lot of disaster areas, a lot of major, major crime and I think they're shocked because it was a blast aimed at them, a terrorist attack on the police and the judicial system. This is Kevin Hitchcock at the corner of Exhibition Street and La Trobe Street in Melbourne returning all network stations to their studios. Thank you very much, Kevin. Anyone who wants information about the bomb blast or those who are injured should ring the police advice line on double one five seven three. That's double one five seven three. The Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, has offered his sympathy to the families of those injured in the blast. Mr Hawke said he deplored what had happened and hoped police could find those responsible as quickly as possible. And Premier John Kane has described today's events as barbaric. He said he will be meeting to discuss whether a reward should be offered for information which resulted in the capture of those responsible. Uh, I think uh, all Victorians would uh, join me in uh, condemning in the strongest possible terms uh, this uh, barbaric act of criminal violence. I want to condemn in the strongest possible way the person or persons, and it would appear to be persons, that are uh, responsible. And I suppose the magnitude and the sophistication of it all is what is most frightening. Uh, I think this incident uh, does add a terrifying uh, dimension to violence, new to Melbourne, only once before in Australia, as uh, I'm advised, where we've had uh, uh, this sort of incident occur. I suppose if there's any redeeming feats in a thing like this, it is that uh, what was demonstrated this afternoon is a capacity to uh, meet a disaster of this kind uh, in a very uh, efficient way. It's just not the sort of thing you'd expect in Melbourne. That was the reaction after today's car bombing. Bombs, terrorist attacks, innocent people in the street falling victim. That's the stuff that overseas news is generally made of. At least, it was. These are the scenes we've learned to expect from world hotspots such as Beirut. The Christian East Sector has experienced yet another horrific bomb attack. But in this city, it's something the people have learned to live with, not that the shock is any less or the suffering any easier to bear. Eight people were killed and dozens buried under tons of shattered masonry following this blast in a busy shopping area. Explosives the weight of an average woman had been placed in a small Renault sedan. The shock blasted a crater a metre deep, destroyed cars and shattered two apartment blocks. In spite of their familiarity with such everyday disasters, rescue crews still had trouble retrieving survivors from the rubble. Just two hours earlier, a mother, her child and four other people were injured when a bomb blew apart an office of President Amin Jamal's Christian Falange party. It was the 53rd time the President's party offices had been bombed since January. Compared to the daily outrages in places like Lebanon, you have to dig fairly deep to find bombing attacks in Australia. Perhaps the biggest of them all was the Hilton Hotel bombing back in 1979, where the Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference was being held. 30 pounds of explosives were placed in a rubbish bin outside the hotel's doors. A warning call was made, but too late. Two city garbage collectors loaded the bin into their heavy steel truck and started up the compactor. They didn't stand a chance. Two years later, in 1981, Melbourne's Swanston Street was rocked by a blast which shattered four shops, causing more than a million dollars damage. Two men were rushed to hospital with burns to 70% of their bodies. Also, Melbourne 1981, a man killed as he was about to appear in court. 
Raymond Chuck Bennett was shot in the chest under the noses of police as he was being led along the corridors of the city court building. A gunman at the top of the staircase pumped two bullets into his chest, then escaped across the roofs of the RMIT buildings. Then in 1983, the Army Bomb Disposal Squad was called into action in Davis Street, Q. It was 2.30pm on Thursday the 10th of February. A pawnbroker had found a device on the front seat of his car and thought it might have been a practical joke. But this was no joke. Just last year, a bomb went off outside the Melbourne Coroner's Court, this time with no injuries, and also last year, a mysterious explosion at a house in Caulfield. But perhaps the largest chapter written in Australia's history of outrages concerns the family court and family court judges. The first, Judge David Opus, gunned to death outside his Wallara home in June 1980. Then Justice Richard Gee, whose Belrose home was blown apart in early March 1984. The Parramatta Family Law Court was badly damaged by a bomb blast in the following month. And then in July 84, possibly the worst of the family law court attacks. The wife of 61-year-old family court judge Justice Ray Watson was killed. The family's Greenwich apartment was shaken to the foundations by a bomb triggered to explode as the front door was opened. Although a member of our family law judiciary had been the target, his wife became the innocent victim. But today's attack, although not an isolated incident, stands out as this city's first senseless terrorist action directed at the public at large. Not yet the streets of Beirut, but a big step closer to the madness. That madness that we thought lurked only beyond our shores. Phone lines open 24 hours a day to collect information from any members of the public who may have been in the area at the time or anyone who may have information which could help them. And uh, I'm told also that they're checking all possibilities, of course. There are many leads they're looking at, but one they're looking at very strongly is the possible link with the death of a man in Monterna last year. A man named uh, Tom Messenger was shot dead by police. He was a member of a neo-fascist group, and he was involved in a gunfight with police and shot dead. And that's one lead they're looking at very closely. Kevin, I was just about to say, I had a call today from someone claiming to represent the National Front in Melbourne, saying they were responsible for the bombing. I don't know if that was a crank call, but what you've just said, uh, there may be some uh, truth in that. That's right, uh, David. The police have, have heard a lot of calls coming in from a, a lot of sources. They're looking at them all, but that one is being looked at very closely and we'll be talking to members of that task force later this evening and we hope to have more information for you then. OK, thank you, Kevin. No, no papers tomorrow, of course, but we'll have all the details here on Channel 10. And uh, for Melbourne, a tragic and a terrible start to Easter. But on this eve of Easter, a reminder about the Good Friday appeal. We know you'll support it tomorrow. But for now, from the Eyewitness News team, our hopes that you have a safe and happy holiday break. Good, Good night. night.